Audit fans to my next video in my Standards Explained series on ASA ISA 520, which is about analytical procedures. Now, I don't know if you remember from a previous video on ASA 500 on audit evidence, but we do have a large range of procedures that the standard talks about. Inspection of documents, tangible assets, confirmation, inquiry, observation, recalculation, analytical procedures and re-performance. And remember, I've added two extra ones to that list, which is the vouching and the tracing. But today, what we're going to be looking at is analytical procedures. The table of contents, talk about the objectives and some, we'll talk about some definitions, the requirements, and then the explanatory material, which of course I don't go through, but it's a good idea to read this if you're a little unsure about my explanation of the standard. Now this is quite an old standard. Uh, the standard was produced in 2009. It hasn't been really updated since that point. Remember that if you see any of these AUS paragraphs, they're only ones related to Australian firms, they're new paragraphs. So let's look at the scope of the standard. And the scope is really, what is this standard all about? And it's about how we use analytical procedures to collect substantive evidence. It also talks about what we need to do near the end of the audit. And I'll talk about why we do analytical procedures at the end of the audit. Now, you know that we already do analytical procedures at the beginning of the audit, and we covered that as part of ASA 315, which says, well, you could use analytics and look for unusual fluctuations to help you identify any areas of risk or material misstatement. But we're just going to be looking at analytical procedures as substantive tests and at the end of the audit. So these substantive procedures are all there to actually help us gather evidence on our different assertions. And remember, our assertions are actually contained within ASA, ISA 315 in paragraph A128. When we look at the objectives, the objectives, and I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit here. So these objectives link back to the main objectives about audits in general. So what do we have to do? We need to get relevant and reliable evidence, and that needs to be sufficient and appropriate. And we also need to design analytical procedures near the end of the audit to make sure that the financial report is consistent with what we know about the company. I'll talk about how the auditor actually does that. So remember our evidence under ASA 500, um, our evidence needs to be relevant, and reliable. And what we have to do is we have to collect a sufficient and appropriate amount of that evidence. So what are analytical procedures? And the definition, you notice that in uh, some of our older standards, there's not much in the definitions, but it says it's a means of evaluating financial information through analysis of plausible relationships among financial and non-financial data. Now, where do those plausible relationships come from? Our plausible relationships actually come from double entry accounting. So we, if we know double entry accounting, and I know that when one thing goes up, something else might go down, or two things might move in the same direction, those are the plausible relationships that I'm talking about. When we're doing our analytical procedures, we're looking at identifying fluctuations or information that is inconsistent with other information that we might get from the firm. And this here is really getting into the mental model approach for collecting evidence. And in uh, ASA 500, I talked about how auditors have to collect sufficient and appropriate evidence. Well, the mental model approach is one of um, three approaches based on collecting certain volumes or having certain lists or the mental model, and this process here in the analytical procedure section really tells us, well, we're looking for things that don't make sense, inconsistencies. Um, I'm looking at analytics and I'm looking with information. Remember back in ASA 315, we have to understand the client. And if we don't understand the client, 
then we can't determine whether something is a fluctuation or not. So what I want to add here, let me just uh, move this off to the side, is a bit more information about explanatory material um, and uh, analytical procedures. So I actually took this, and I know I don't usually look at an um, I know I don't usually look at the uh, explanatory material, I'll just make some more room here. But the explanatory material had some really good information about the definition. So it's uh, comparisons of the entity's financial information with comparable information from prior periods, anticipated results like budgets, or similar industry information, or uh, sometimes you might see them called industry averages. All right. Um, now, comparable information from prior periods, that's always one that's actually a, a pretty good one to look for uh, when we do our comparison. So that's pretty common. There are some concerns that put me as a maybe for using anticipated results like, like budgets, because we know that budgets can definitely be manipulated. Right. Uh, so budgetary slack, building in um, some cushion into the budget might mean that comparing to a budget might not be so useful. Similar industries can be a good one in circum circ certain circumstances. And that will all depend on how well your client is similar to industries in this, uh, companies in the same industry that make up that average. Otherwise, it might not be the best thing to actually use as a comparison. You might not use an industry average. You might use you know, averages from a small sample of firms that are closer to your particular audit client. Now, our analytical procedures are also considering relationships. Uh, so they talk about here elements of financial information that would expect to conform to a predict predictable pattern like gross margin percentages. So that means that when you make a sale, you go debit, cash or accounts receivable, and then you go credit, sales revenue. All right, and that's gonna be the first journal entry that you have here. The second journal entry is going to be debit, cost of goods sold, credit, inventory. Okay, if you're selling a good. So therefore, in this particular situation, if we know that revenue is going up by a certain percentage, all else being held equal, COGS should go up, that's an increase, by the same percentage, all right? These two numbers should be the same all else being held equal. So we need to think about, and this comes from our double entry bookkeeping, these predictable patterns that we would expect to see. Just like, you know, for example, um, in Australia, the Banking Royal Commission, I would expect most banks to have higher legal fees because they had to hire lots and lots of lawyers for lots and lots of days at lots and lots of money. Now, other things that the explanatory material A2 actually says is that we might consider between financial information and non-financial information, uh, like payroll costs to the number of employees. So that might be that you take the number of employees, multiply it by an average salary to get some sort of cost. But the analytical procedures are really only limited by your imagination and data. So this means that for auditors, one thing that's going to be really important is a good understanding of data analytics. Now we've always done data analytics, auditors have always analyzed data, but we might need to understand how systems collect and organize data so that we can use it more efficiently to do these analytical procedures. Because remember, in analytical procedures, I don't need to sample, I use an entire data set, and that gives me quite a lot of power, and it reduces the sampling risk. All right, so let me just move, scroll back here to the standard. 
And we're gonna dig into now what the requirements say. And remember the requirements are the legally enforceable components. So when I design and perform my substantive analytics, I shall do some things. I have to determine that the particular substantive analytical procedure matches the assertion, all right, that I've considered risk. And that I need to evaluate the reliability of, from, of the data that I'm developing this on. So that really means it needs to link back to my evaluation of the client's internal controls. Because most times when I am doing analytical procedures, I am using data from inside the client. So if their internal controls are poor, I might not be able to rely on substantive analytical procedures to the same extent. What other things do I need to consider? I need to develop an expectation of what I should see um, so that then I can identify a misstatement. So if I expect that in a particular industry, I'm expecting to see increases of 5%, then in this client, if I see an increase of 10%, then I might be a little bit concerned, all right? So rather than being really happy, I might be a little bit worried. That's supposed to be my worried face there. So I have to develop these expectations and then for anything that's different, I have to do further investigation. All right, I need to do more audit testing or substantive work. Now a thing to remember with analytical procedures is that quite often an analytical procedure will not pinpoint the exact source or location of a material misstatement, all right? It can say in this general area, but it can't say necessarily this one specific transaction. So during the audit, when I'm using this to gather evidence about different assertions, I do need to make sure that it might point me in a direction, so it might have let me just draw a little example here. I might have my whole set of data and it might say, ah, oh, Amanda, where I want you to look for misstatements is this little wedge here. Then you would go in and you would do more substantive testing in that particular place. All right, so you can't normally, very rarely just rely on analytical procedures. Now the second requirement um, is, a little, is one you might not have heard of, which is analytical procedures at the end of the audit. So this here is something that we look at when we get to the end or the conclusion of the audit. So what it says is that I have to perform analytical procedures near the end of the audit that assist them with forming their overall conclusion. So I'm gonna scroll across here to give myself some more room. All right. So what we will normally have at the risk assessment stage of the audit, which is right in the beginning in that planning phase, is I'm going to do a list of analytical procedures. All right, and those lists, it could be some sort of ratio analysis. Can't spell analysis. I could be common sizing my financial statements. Um, I could be looking for other trends. Now, I use those to help me identify particular areas of risk. All right, areas where I'm going to spend more time on the audit doing extra work and testing. All right, so I'm gonna use those areas of risk to help me gather specific levels of evidence about those risks. Got a spelling error there. All right, so I'm gonna have, I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna collect substantive evidence. Okay, let me write substantive. Substantive evidence about those risks. Then theoretically, if I've found errors, because typically what will happen, if I found an error, 
then that error is going to result in some sort of adjustment. All right. So then what do I do? I'm going to, oh, I'm running out of room here. I need to move across a bit more. Then what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to ask management to make adjustments, all right? And then I'm going to have an adjusted income statement and balance sheet, all right? Now, on that adjusted income statement and balance sheet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rerun these analytical procedures on this data, all right? Now, the reason that I'm going to do that is because I'm looking for errors that disappear, all right? So what I'm looking for, let me write this down here, is at the end of the audit, so at the end of the audit, any unusual fluctuations that I found at the beginning should disappear if I've detected all of the misstatements in this process. Now what happens if you get here and you still have questions, all right? You still find unusual fluctuations. Well, then the thing you need to do next is you need to go away and you need to do further investigation because what that means is that there may be an undetected misstatement. So this analytical procedure that we do at the very end, the same replication of this on our adjusted financial statements, is there as my last line of defense to help me figure out, are there any undetected material misstatements? All right, let's go back here. As I mentioned before, I said, if we do find anything where we identify fluctuations or relationships that are inconsistent with information, then I have to investigate, all right? I document, I investigate. I talk to management about what might happen, and then I perform other audit procedures, vouching, tracing, inspecting documents. I hope this explanation of ASA 520 was useful. Um, I didn't go through specific ratios here. There are certainly plenty of videos on YouTube for that. Um, and I do talk about ratio analysis in some of my other videos. Thanks very much for watching. And if you thought the video was great, I'd love to get a thumbs up. If you have any questions, pop them in the comments. You can always catch me on social media. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing. Thanks, and I will see you next time.